recording in three, two, one, and I'm with Danny Brewster. How are you, Danny? I'm good. How's 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 Canada treating you? Canada, Canada's treating me. Canada's treating me okay. I don't know. I see a lot of stuff on uh, than India with the news that's going on right now. Yeah. Oh, sorry. How's India treating me, or how's Canada treating uh, me? How's how, how's Canada treating you in relation? Uh, in comparison to how India oh in comparison to yeah no I mean we're definitely going through some tough times in India right now I'm actually gonna I was thinking of making some content today just to kind of give a to give you know the audience a bit more color in terms of what's going on in India and you know some of our efforts um, and then what we're trying to make happen and not just us I mean the beauty of Bitcoin is that it's not just us you know it's like anybody and everybody that has some interest in bitcoin like balaji just wrote this like amazing piece about how the indian government should launch the indian digital rupee but then you know have digital gold i.e bitcoin as reserves for their rupee like thank you balaji like that that would have taken me like you know six months to write like he just like whips it up and it's like so i i love kind of the swarm nature of, of bitcoin and and you know when things are like fantastic and things are on the up and up it's like it's kind of easy things are on cruise control you kind of don't want to even like disturb it but it's when things get tough that i find i shine and i get most excited because that's when the challenge is there like you know what i mean and most people when bad things happen i find they scatter um you know they 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 run for they run for the hills uh and so in in india uh i'm very um hopeful i'm very inspired because the community i'm very like I feel like everyone's really banded together and they're, they're coming together in a way that I've never seen before. So maybe that, that's kind of what I'll say without, you know, <laughs> making it too much about me. Um, Danny. So uh, I usually start with where did we meet? Uh, where do we connect? I think the first time, uh, I mean, I probably heard about you way before I actually met you, but I think the first time we actually met was at one of my events in Toronto. Was that correct? Yeah, it was actually the, the the first conference that I attended. I've got um, like close family that live in Toronto. Um, so I came over to see them, mixed it in uh, with the conference. Um, the venue, the, the atmosphere um, was great. There was a, a little bit of a blockchain stuff going on there at the time. And I, I already crossed the, the chasm into yeah, blockchain won't solve every problem, um, but this is like so it's what, five, six years ago now, um, which is absolutely crazy um, as to, to just how long uh, we've been down this rabbit hole that is Bitcoin. Um, but absolutely love the event. And I, the, the next time that the world becomes a little bit more sane with travel restrictions and stuff and not having to, to lock ourselves away when we return or arrive in a new place for, for almost two weeks, then I'm going to, to be coming over if you're doing more of those events. Um, Sweet. Well, I'm excited to, really excited to hear that. Um, hey, Danny, just, just on, the, on the note around blockchain, by the way, I freaking hate and have always hated and I've blogged about the fact that I hate the word blockchain. However, however, you are correct. It pays the bills. It pays the bills to keep the conference lights on. It, I'd like I'd like to say it pays the bills if I hadn't lost a hundred grand on that event you came to. It, it almost pays the bills. But what it does do, what it does do is it it's like the most beautiful Trojan horse you've ever met. Cause we would literally have banks like sending like, you know, paying for and sending, you know, like you said, like, you know, 50 people from their compliance department to come and learn about blockchain, you know, to, to obviously learn about blockchain, but like, you know, from Max Kaiser <laughs> or from Adam Back. <laughs> so we would stack our, 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 you know, our tone base. <laughs> we would, uh, the goal would be, I mean, I, with the goal with my events and just community building in general has always been to meet people where they're at, you know what I mean? But then give them 
what I believe to be true, which is like the truth, right? The Bitcoin being the truth. Uh, yeah. Anyway, so 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 Danny, what? Let's go and maybe try and capture your story. As I was telling you before, you know, I uh, everyone's got their own story. Bitcoin's nothing more than ones and zeros. And you know, we were kind of chatting about this before, but like as entrepreneurs in this space, you know, I can't help but feel that. Um, it's really easy to have our stories buried mainly because, well, mainly because of the way the media works. And, you know, if I had to summarize it in a few words, like my experience with them has been, they usually have an angle or some sort of like scoop, right? And they're trying to fit you in it. And you think there's something bigger happening, but there isn't. And, and I don't know, and the narrative gets built that way. Um, and so one of the reasons I'm kind of like doing this, you know, on a Sunday, Saturday, Monday, every day, I'm doing like interviews and talking to people and, and kind of, you know, just capturing people's stories is because because I think that's where Bitcoin, the lessons are, that's where, you know, where, where people can, can kind of like take the most from and grow and build their own businesses and do things. So, so, so really glad that you, you know, decided to come on, but where does your story begin? My Bitcoin story or life journey um, towards Bitcoin. Um, the, the life story uh, was pretty like disruptive through school, enjoyed computers, school bored me. I did okay with results and everything. Um, the further education wouldn't take me here in the UK because of my school report, I wanted to go on and do computer science, um, but got turned down because of the school report because I was too disruptive, um, kind of learned why. Uh, and lots of regrets around that now, later on as an adult uh, with children. So, um, but, left school and went and got a job in a bank, became the youngest employee um, for uh, a bank here in the UK at the time, just turned 16, uh, qualified as a personal financial consultant before I was 18, couldn't get uh, registered with the Financial Services Authority as it was then, which is the F uh, FSC, uh, FCA now, sorry, um, because I was too young. So I couldn't actually give financial advice, uh, but I did all of the, the, the education and stuff. Um, left the banks, got into uh, the family businesses. Um, one of them we sold, uh, my, was originally my grandparents' business, which enabled them to retire. Um, and then uh, lost my mother in 2009. Um, didn't really like do too much, made some investments, made some good investments, some bad investments during that period of time. Uh, backed a couple of uh, like startups. Uh, then discovered Bitcoin and it was just made the mistake of going uh, full-time Bitcoin from around about uh, 2012, middle of 2012. Um, and then uh, my ex-partner, my daughter's mother, married somebody in the RAF, got posted to Cyprus for one of the UK um, RAF bases on Cyprus. So booked my life and moved to Cyprus to, to give my daughter that experience and to, to be close to her so I could maintain that real strong relationship that I have uh, with her and landed in Cyprus, was trading Bitcoin, um, like OTC on local, uh, like local Bitcoins and similar sites and on, um, uh, on IRC, sorry, for all types of different gift cards, prepaid, um, vouchers and stuff, at really high margins and uh, just making making fear gains, uh, being happy with the, the trading, living a, a pretty all right life, uh, was happy. And then the bank balance happened in Cyprus. Um, so, and that's where it all went magnificently uh, <laughs> The, well, the uh, the idea of Neo and B was born um, at that time. Under the, the the original idea for the name was Bitbank uh, or Bit Banking for for it, and then we uh, we did stupidly raised some capital um, from within the the Bitcoin community uh, on like Bitfunder, um, BTCT dot co, um, all of like it was. Uh, like crowdfunded, which now looking back on it, it was like absolutely insane. And a lot of the people behind these platforms got into uh, the trouble 
for it, uh, have locker and things like that. So we raised capital, built the, the company out, had like amazing marketing, uh, made some good hires, made some really bad hires, um, made some huge mistakes of going too big too soon. Um, but it really did put Bitcoin on the map. Um, but I was extremely naive at the time uh, with the decisions that was taken, it was far too early. Uh, and even now, a lot of the, the ideas that we had then, or that I had then, because um, the book does stop here, were far too early. But now we're seeing some of those ideas come to fruition, um, but broken out into like individual products uh, for users. Um, like we was really pushing boundaries at creating uh, like a multi-sig uh, wallet for users so we could help give them a guided experience, but also give them um, an arm of control as well over their own funds. So things like CASA and everything like that, which are doing great and doing far better than uh, anything that, that I've built. Um, they, we had those ideas, but in 20, uh, 2013, 2014, um, the, we had a, a payment network of uh, like merchants. We were so close to having uh, McDonald's in Cyprus accepting Bitcoin. Uh, we were just waiting for the, the sign off um, from them and stuff like that. So, but now looking back, um, it, it would have been, uh, history could have been so much, or things could have played out so much differently for me um, because if I was so uh, invested in payments on Bitcoin, if we had all of these merchants, when the, the fees started rising, um, we, we may have been on that side of the fence of, oh, let's just increase the block size because that will solve all of our problems. Um, that would have been the most one dimensional um, decision that I could have taken. And back then I might have taken that. Um, but when it actually came around to the, the block size debate and stuff, uh, yeah, I wanted to, I'd grown up and matured with my opinions and took more of a, a technical uh, approach to, to scaling and stuff. So I fell on the arguably what the market is showing to be the right side of history uh, with all of that. But looking back now, I could have very easily been on the other side of the fence. Um, happily, uh, uh, one of the, the, good, the good points that actually came from it is that, that I didn't fall on that side. Um, and then everything like exploded. Uh, and I had to go quiet for the best part of three years whilst I uh, was being offered every out possible, which included uh, signing over um, absolutely everything uh, that we'd created, physical branch location, which was absolutely beautiful. It was like an Apple store, but for a physical location for, for, merch, uh, for uh, retail users to go in and interact with Bitcoin like they would the traditional bank in Cyprus. Um, it was absolutely stunning. Um, we spent a whole bunch of money creating that. Um, and then the, the software wasn't ready, so we couldn't really, um, we didn't take any or have any customers up until the point of everything exploding. Um, so no no users lost out or customers lost out in, the, uh, in, in everything going south and going terrible. But um, if you read the media and everything like that, ours portrayed as, I just disappeared with everybody's money in Cyprus. And uh, then investors also felt the same way. Um, but I was actually funding the company myself because back when Bitcoin was uh, like less than $100, uh, the Bitcoins that we actually raised weren't anything like those types of uh, the money that they would be today. And it just absolutely uh, creases me at the stomach that we, uh, like, we flippantly would uh, give away um, bitcoins at press gatherings and stuff not whole coins but it probably equates to more than like whole coins and stuff um to to like members of the the media and stuff and uh people that were well connected in cyprus uh and so and now looking back it's absolute insanity that we did that sort of thing <laughs> so yeah it's um there were some like huge lessons uh, and when I uh, was all of like, the legal issues and stuff that was related to it, uh, I literally felt 
I could have been much better on the communication side with the people that back the company, and uh, I, I really didn't do too well um, in that in those aspects. But at the end of the day, when I look back, I didn't go to prison for or spend any time in jail um, for crimes that I didn't commit because the accusations that were made against me were patently false. Um, but everything in the media um, was just she painting me out to be the the worst person in in the world and it was uh yeah it, it really didn't uh, do me any favors for even now um i still get people that that point to everything and say uh you're mr bad you did this and it's like actually i didn't it didn't actually play out like that um but i fought extradition and um was uh, I was on under house arrest for, for three months with an electronic tag on my ankle um, for for five accusations that was absolutely bonkers um, when he actually broke the accusations down and then they dropped it out of nowhere. Um, they was adamant they wanted to extradite me from the UK to Cyprus. Uh, I only came back for five days and I'm still here. Um, so so and they, they, they dropped it, sent two officers over um, to interview me at the Cypriot Embassy in London um, because they wanted to, to close their investigation down. Um, and then after a five hour interview where I wasn't allowed uh, legal representation, I asked the interviewing officers, what would you do in my position? Uh, and they turned around and said, we'd see these people in court um, if they've cost you everything that they'd cost and uh, and my reputation uh, and everything. Um, looked into it, uh, really. But when it comes to like making false accusations, it's a libel case. And as we're seeing in the space with a, a couple of people now that are being sued um, for libel, the, the cases drag on. And the only winners are the lawyers. And it's a case, it's, a, it's an arms race as to, to who's got, who can out, out spend and outlast the other party um, in, in most cases. So, and for me, it was a, do I draw a line under this and build my way out of this and build a, a product and a service um, and build something positive from it, taking all of the lessons on board um, that we have, uh, or that I have learned from uh, Neo and B and everything that came after it. Uh, so I retaught myself how to code um, just got into the code, iterated out uh, to a product, um, broke our entire stack, the, the compliance, the, we've got like hardware that operates in retail locations and stuff, um, and built out fast bitcoins. And a couple of the people that backed Neo and B came on board as co-founders. Um, and we've even got people that worked at Neo and B working with fast bitcoins now. Um, and things are just going in the right direction. Um, so I really, the lessons, like it's 100% what went down, like the book stops here, I was at the top, um, I made the decisions, I can go over all of the decisions, I can be the most critical person of myself um, and I can do it from a factual uh, position, but there's a lot of people, there's not even a lot of people these days, there's probably two or three that wish to attack, that, that would try and say, attack me, but attack me using words um, from a position that's not born out of the truth. Um, they're just positions taken based upon what was written at the time um, and the narrative that was pushed uh, around about me. So yeah, so my story as to, to where we're at today um, and like when just, as of today, like this last month was our best month on record. But since the like the coronavirus lockdowns and stuff, we we're operating across uh, North America, Europe, um, Australia, Africa. Um, we're we're doing business uh, in multiple countries um, and just growing uh, and going from strength to strength. We've got people joining the team um, that are helping me level up and the rest of the team. Uh, just really like enjoying it, even if the last month or so has been a slog to get a new update out um, because we're adding um, like new countries, uh, like 
that we're, we're working towards bringing online and different payment services and, and stuff like that. So it's, the last month's probably been one of those staring into the abyss moments. Um, it's never going to end uh, as met or every startup founder goes through. Um, but luckily I've got some great people on the team that I can turn to and talk to uh, about stuff. And I, I still literally write pretty much every line of code um, for, for our complete stack from compliance all the way through to, to how coins are delivered to, to users and um, stuff like that. So, yeah. Wow, Danny, that was, a uh, that, was, that was quite a journey. Yeah, man. Well, first of all, thank you for sharing. I mean, just, you know, I, we, I know we have a lot more we want to cover, but that, thanks for sharing all that, dude. I, I really appreciate it. Thanks for coming to the event. First of all, like that was cool getting to meet you. And I remember, I, I did. I, did I recognize you when I saw you? I'm pretty sure. I, no, or maybe, I think you told me who you were or something. But I think very quickly uh, we had connected the dots. And I was. I, and you know, I mean, real recognizes real. I guess I don't know. And and you look. I mean, sometimes look. I, I think we all make mistakes. Um, you know, I'm not a lawyer. I'm not an investigator. Um, but I, I think it's important that people get to at least speak their, their piece, you know, and, uh, and so thanks for, thanks for sharing, man. I appreciate it. Um, a couple of things I wanted to just kind of rewind and touch on, uh, just for maybe people that, you know, don't, uh, know, first of all, you, you kind of, uh, you, you kind of alluded, or you mentioned the word bail-in. Uh, I know that's not really like relevant or super maybe relevant to the story, but I, I think it's relevant to Bitcoin. I think it's relevant to, uh, to you know, people understanding the world a little bit better. Uh, do you want to maybe just uh, just touch on that a little bit uh, in terms of, because I think most people have heard about the word bail out, but I don't think many people even know what a bail-in is and let alone that it happened in Cyprus. And I think it is one of the most important and instructive things that's ever happened, at least in my lifetime. So do you want to just maybe touch on that for me? Yeah, um, I I actually have a view of the bailing event now um, that's probably different to, to what it was at the time. So what happened was in Cyprus, um, the the banks was lending out money uh, left, right, and centre, uh, creating a, a credit bubble, and the people stopped paying those loans back and the the banks were starting to, to default and the, the country was getting into to financial trouble and as part of the bailout package from um, the European Central Bank they basically said that they need to recapitalize the banks using the depositors funds um, this is a bail-in so they don't take funds from outside to plow them into the banks they take the funds from within the bank and use it to uh, recapitalize the bank and in exchange, what the, the original plan was, was for 8% um, of everything over a thousand euros in your accounts, 8% of that was going to be taken and used to recapitalize the banks. Now, people were upset at that idea because the, the, the bank has this insurance that guarantees every customer's deposits up to a certain threshold that didn't matter um, in that, that moment. The, the plan was, and I, we hired somebody at Neo and B that previously worked at one of the, the banks and they was in charge of the software uh, implementing the script to run across their database to perform that haircut of everybody's deposits. Um, but that got tossed out when the, the president was like, I can't sell this to the people. And then what they did, was 50% of everything over 100K. So, so it, was, it was touted as taxing the rich or taxing the, the Russian money that was in the Cypriot banks, hiding away. Um, but the, the Russian money and all of the politicians' money and their families' money left Cyprus months before. Um, so it was businesses, um, people's retirement funds and uh, Did you say 50% above what? 100K? 100K. 100K. So, so if you had 200K, you was just haircut. Okay. And you used a lot of big words that I understood, but I want to make sure everyone understands what you just said. So you're pretty much saying, and so the bail in, you know, capitalized, da, 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 okay. All that means is, is that like, if you had a bank or if someone had a bank account at one of these banks, 
now all of a sudden the banks needed money because they took loans and whatever, whatever, and they weren't going to now go to the government and print money, but instead they were just going to turn to you <laughs> and say, hey, I'm going to take $8 out of every hundred. And then eventually they said, well, and if you, instead of doing that, we're going to just take $50 out of every hundred dollars above a hundred thousand dollars in, in your bank account or whatever, or someone's bank account. Is that correct? That's crazy, yeah. you know? That's, that's what's happened. And that's what happened. And that's what happened. So if you had, like I said, 200 K in your bank account, you would be yeah. left with 150 Yeah. or you'd be left with a hundred. No, 150, 150. Exactly. Okay, cool. Okay. I mean, not cool. So, Opposite of cool, but yeah. <laughs> um, so this was uh, a real wait. What, or at the time I naively thought this is a real world wake up call for people to now learn and understand that when you put money into a bank, it's no longer your money. You're lending it. You're an unsecured creditor to the bank. And they sell this idea that you have this insurance and everything to, to cover everything up to like 85,000 euros or 85,000 pounds in the UK. I'm not sure. Is it the FDIC insurance in the US and things? Um, but that didn't matter then. Um, they literally took people's money and uh, to, to recapitalize the bank. They did give them shares of the, the, the bank in exchange, um, but those shares was pretty worthless at the time because the bank was pretty much bankrupt. And uh, yeah, I thought, yeah, people are gonna wake up to this idea that the banks and the financial system is corrupt uh, and everything and look for the, the, the perfect alternative. Uh, which Bitcoin ultimately is. Uh, but at the time, it, very different to, to how it is today. Um, it, it still has its challenges for, with regards to, to being accepted, but pretty much everybody's heard of it now. Um, somebody, or almost everybody on the planet, you would think, probably naively, but a good chunk of the developed world have heard the word Bitcoin. Um, and know it as some kind of digital currency, even if they don't know what it is or understand how to use it or have never actually interacted with it, but they've heard of it. Back then, it really wasn't like that. And we, at, at Neo and B, we went out and we pushed everything um, into the, we pushed everybody into the top of the funnel um, on the island. Every um, billboard, every newspaper, on the, the TV with the, the currency report, Bitcoin, the Bitcoin price was being reported. Um, we really absolutely smashed um, the, the marketing um, and really brought the Bitcoin uh, idea to the fore. But did like you guys have physical locations or were they going to be built? No, we had one. We had the first one. Um, okay. which came in massively over budget and it cost us around about 450,000 euros to <laughs> build out. But it was, but, but it was stupid. It, it's a real bad idea. <laughs> um, but when you actually look at it, it was, it made an eye, uh, it made like the Apple iStore uh, look bland. Uh, it was a beautiful piece of architecture, um, the way that it was developed. And I was told by the, the marketing and PR agency that we were using, that you've got to have this appearance of being um, big to be trusted and to have a big team and everything. For the average person that we were targeting, um, like the retail client in Cyprus, you've got to have that appearance um, for them to be able to trust you because they're used to the, the big institutions. They're, there's... Uh, in a way, I, I feel now like it was so bad, and this is why I literally we bootstrapped everything at Fast Bitcoins um, to be as lean as we possibly can. Um, we we've got the smallest payroll um, possible to, to keep, and we we do everything on a shoestring to to make sure that we're as efficient as possible. And it's a huge um, learning uh, or part of the learning from Neo and B. Um, so we had like that physical store that was beautiful. Um, we had the big team, we had the big, like the, the big monthly expenses, the, the, the offices in the, the newest building in the capital. Um, and it was during a time where 
the, the economy was absolutely in tatters. And, and we thought Bitcoin going up to uh, $1,200 on Mt. Gox was amazing. Um, we, we'd made it now. Uh, <laughs> how naive. Um, and uh, it, yeah. <laughs> so, so, so I, just, I guess the, I mean, the lesson there, what you, well, part of the lesson, what you're saying is, is that, you know, start small and start more like scrappy and organic and bootstrap and don't, you know, like don't put like the show before kind of the, you know what I mean? Like the actual product. And so it sounds like you, you've kind of applied a lot of those lessons to your, your current business. So what is it called? Fast Bitcoins? Yeah, fastbitcoins.com. And, and what is that? Is that like a website where people can just buy Bitcoins real quick? Yeah. I guess. Yeah, um, we've got a, a blended physical and digital offering now. So we've got the physical locations. We've got stores that have got hardware in that you can go in and use cash to buy Bitcoin. Um, Where? So talk, um, the UK, Canada, Australia, Estonia. Um, we've got places in Kenya, uh, Uganda. Um, and we're, we're growing that network. Um, for and how do people on. get money into your, your system? Like they, they use your credit card? You can go into a, a store near you in Canada with um, like $20 and either buy a prepaid voucher or give them a barcode, which the, they can scan on the device and they'll just deposit that $20 to our platform that you can choose to buy Bitcoin. Um, cool. with like the, the first cash to lightning exchange in the world, um, I think was probably the first lightning exchange uh, or exchange where you could go from fear onto the lightning network directly to receive the coins that we launched in january 2019 um so we was up there with the, the first and all of the teething problems of the lightning network um that's one thing um that i will say is that i've always tried to push the envelope with realistically with what's available um there's, I know there's people that can probably point and say, oh, but you're not doing this in DeFi or um, this, that, and the other. But the, 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 for me, the real world doesn't really want to be using DeFi um, as how it's touted right now. Um, it's still the thing of nerds um, and speculators and um, even, even Bitcoin is to a degree, but we've got so many opportunities that we can build out uh, and stuff. Um, and the, the goal with fast bitcoins is we want to create a billion bitcoiners um, around the world. So, and then once we've got that level, not even if it's just ourselves, I'd like to, to see everybody else doing it as well, um, to create as many bitcoiners uh, as we possibly can. And then you can start, you've got a solid foundation to start offering um, other more uh, useful services on top of that. Um, because you've got a solid foundation then of, you, uh, of potential users. Um, because right now, I, I still feel that a lot of people are coming in for number go up. And each cycle, if, say, 10% stay around for the movement, they are uh, like longer term uh, Bitcoiners. Then if, if we can keep growing that base, you can then build other financial services on top of Bitcoin uh, and Lightning and whatever side chains come around. Um, uh, but we need that platform first to, to have actual real Bitcoiners. Um, and then you can start uh, dumping however many millions of venture capital into um, sparkly products built on top of it. Cool. So you're, you're like pro lightning, pro Bitcoin. Um, no, I was going to tell you one thing. So I think I mentioned this maybe prior to us hitting the record button, but yeah, I mean, you know, I think your learn your lesson there about like not going too big off the bat is like probably a really good one. Um, but for what it's worth, what it's worth to this day, I remember the pictures or wherever I remember seeing them on Twitter or Reddit or, um, uh, you know, I, I think you did you did kind of capture people's imagination and and uh, in, in a way made Bitcoin like real like in the sense that like something physical and and did it artfully and i i remember it was like a yellow and kind of a black color theme and and it was really really classy and so it, 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 I mean, the closest thing to that that I've seen manifest in the world are probably like Bitcoin ATM machines. Um, and 
and yeah, yeah, we, we, I mean, in India, there's been, a, I think there's been a company that's been trying to do physical, you know, physical stores as well, which I'm, you know, I'm, I'm for, uh, maybe, but, but I, I wonder, I wonder um, why that hasn't really quite, you know, taken off. I mean, I guess in, in kind of the, this pandemic era, you can kind of see how maybe it, it doesn't, you know, resonate as much, right, the mobile angle, but I think when it's back, you know, banks exist, right, people still want that physical kind of uh, interaction, Right. So so it's probably maybe just like a timing thing, like you said, maybe it's just like, you know, eventually they'll be everywhere. But have yeah. you thought about that? Like, you know, yeah. why? Um, one of the biggest issues with fast bitcoins was um, when I was planning it, I was short sighted enough to to not see that the whole world would go into shutdown uh, and lockdown. So all of the, the physical locations, um, unless they was like convenience or food stores um, or pharmacies uh, would have to close. So. Um, we, during that period of time, I, we made an announcement uh, that was going to stop sales. Because that's all we had at the time was the physical network, which is difficult to grow. It's quite capex intensive. So it costs quite a lot to, to grow that network, especially when you've got your own hardware and stuff that you're trying to push out to, um, to, to physical merchants. And you've got the, the, the acquisition cost of going out and getting those merchants and selling them on the idea uh, when I created the, the merchant, the idea for the merchant network, I wanted to do it so there was no barriers to entry. So we didn't charge them for hardware. We give them a credit account. So they, they don't have to actually commit anything um, other than the, the contract and putting the, um, the marketing materials in their store and servicing the, the customers and then sending us payment um, when we issued the invoices. And so we created as low a barrier of entry as we possibly could um, for that. And it, it was it really intensive and the, the price swings and stuff uh, of, of Bitcoin you, you were kind of exposed um, for the merchant network. But during that period of time when we went into lockdown, we also had um, compliance uh, legislation come into effect in the European Union for the fifth money laundering directive. So, and we were starting to, to grow. We was growing 60 odd percent a month um, up to that period of time. And we're starting to get bottlenecks in the system, like especially with the compliance overhead and stuff. So we took the time to, or I took the time to rebuild our entire tech stack from the bottom up again, um, taking all of the lessons of the, the initial uh, year and a bit before the coronavirus became a thing. And we built out a, a whole new compliance um, system that manages everything. Most of it is automated now. Our risk management uh, and reporting and everything takes care mostly of itself with our compliance officer giving it uh, oversight and making certain decisions. Um, so, and then we also, going forward, wanted to introduce electronic means of depositing. So if the rest of the world does go into shutdown or we have localized shutdowns in certain parts of the, the world, we can still service users uh, and customers so they can deposit. Um, we're still going through the, the process uh, with some of them, but like in Australia, you can have like wire transfers. Um, we've got other payment providers as well coming on board. Uh, to give us fiat rails in so we can service more customers around the world um, without having to, to grow this physical network. Um, we can do it alongside. Um, and then once we've got enough Bitcoiners, because all of our physical locations can also accept lightning payments um, at the point of sale. Um, you can't do on-chain payments, but you can pay via lightning to any of our merchants that want to accept Bitcoin. Uh, for the goods and services uh, and we see uh, some people and there's a there's a video done by a guy in Vancouver um, who happened across one of our locations and he was like oh um, this is proof for me that lightning can work in the real world uh, and we've actually got like these hardware devices that sit in people's stores all over the world um, and they can accept lightning payments and stuff uh, oh, so, that looks badass. What is that? Can you show that again? Is that like a POS? Uh, Android-based POS. Oh. That we wrote the, uh, the software, uh, or I wrote the software and the MDM software to manage it. So we update it all over the air and stuff. And uh, that gives us... Jesus. So th 
that you can take credit cards and stuff on there or is that like your own no, card we, or what is that you can pay with lightning on there um we can build it out nice. to to make it accept uh, card payments as well if we want to um but i'm more interested in creating bitcoiners right now um so what was how, what does that look like so i come there with a blue wallet let's say i've got some bitcoin in there on my lightning wallet and i can now pay yeah, that, if, that, if that, like that the, the guy wallet. in vancouver went in and bought some chocolate just paid the the couple of but why, why would I need that big device? Like, why can't you just build an app that anybody because can have on any Android? Like, what does that do what, that's different that, from my phone or whatever? The, the payment processing side on that is just a bit of a gimmick. It doesn't get used that much. Um, so not in relation to like the amount of Bitcoin that we sell. So people go into a store um, and that device can print off a voucher. that has got a voucher code that you can then redeem on fastbitcoins.com. Um, through your account and exchange that for Bitcoin and receive your Bitcoin. The payment processing is uh, more of a, it was a weekend project for me um, as something cool that I could add to it. Uh, and it, and it's a bit of a party trick right now, um, as are all Bitcoin uh, payment processing solutions, other, other than like BTC pay server, um, which is like a self-hosted philosophically like you're doing Bitcoin the right way if you're hosting it yourself, which isn't for everybody. Um, and right now we've got no basis to build a business model around payment processing. Um, so we don't push it or anything like that. And Fair enough. But your main business is what? It's an app where I you mean, can buy Bitcoin, right? Fastbitcoins.com. Yeah, we, we've not actually launched the, the Android and iOS apps. We're literally developing them now. We've got cool. another channel that's in development. Um, but that's uh, in, in the pipeline as well. Uh, but I'd, like I say before, <laughs> I'd rather get stuff done and then talk about it. Um, I, I don't like to make announcements of announcements. Or anything like oh, that. yeah. yeah. Um, no, I hear you. And hey, hey, Danny, I was going to say, if we can just maybe, I was going to say, you know, uh, in terms of like, obviously, um, you know, the details and stuff, I'm not Barbara Walters and I'm not like a lawyer, nor do, do I really you don't care that much. Um, but, uh, you know, it was interesting to hear, however, though, that you did kind of, when you told your story, you did clarify that, you know, you had kind of gone through the legal process and talked to whatever officers and had kind of cleared your name. Is that correct? Like in terms of all that process, right? Oh yeah. that I was never actually charged. I was only accused of like five crimes. Um, they added on money laundering to kind of give it weight for them to, uh, but it was like a total of like 34 years of jail time hanging over my head for the best part of two years while all this went on. Um, but I cleared it absolutely like never being charged with a crime in my entire life, um, still to this day. And everything that I was accused of was pretty laughable um, when you actually broke it down to accusation by accusation. There was one of them uh, that claimed that... I'd signed a contract that had an incorrect representation of a company's name because it had LTD on the end as if it was a limited company. Um, so, it, and the accusation was when this contract was, um, I produced this contract and misrepresented it to somebody as if the company had been registered and that company hadn't been registered on the date on the contract. Um, and this was uh, trying to be used against me in a, as fraud, as like trying to obtain um, money under false pretenses um, and uttering a false document because I'd so apparently signed this contract. Although the, the document that they provided had no signature on it. Um, and when it actually came down to it, this contract wasn't written by me. It was written by the person that had actually made the accusation. And I'd got the email of me sending this contract back stating, this is wrong. This needs changing because this company isn't, uh, registered yet it's not a limited company so if you change that everything else is fine uh, and i've got the emails to to show that um but if you go out and tell the media um oh yeah we're after him for fraud um that's what the accusations are then in the the, the media and in the headlines it's danny brewster's wanted for fraud <laughs> but the actual fraud in the the accusation was utterly bonkers um for, for, for no, it's, no, but isn't it funny, though, how we do live in a world uh, where people can make accusations, 
those accusations can find their way into the news. The whole world can learn about them. Then you, then you counter those accusations. They become untrue, yet the news never puts out the correction, nor do people even care to hear it. Yes. So we remain in this like world of limbo. I mean, it's happened to us, like our like friends and coworkers and people in Bitcoin. I know so many people that's happened to, but it's awful, isn't it? Is it awful? Yeah. Um, and the, the problem is when, when somebody says to me, oh, who runs the world? And people talk about money ruling the world and the narrative and con- the people with the, the money control the narrative. The people that control the narrative are the people that pay the media that control the purse strings that pay the media. So the advertising agencies, there is nobody that controls the narrative more than the, the advertising and PR agencies. Um, if you'll know, you, you will have worked with PR agencies. If, if there's a story due to go out, you can, if you speak to the right agency, you can say, uh, we'll up their advertising spend for our company in their, in their paper or on their website. Um, and they won't run with that story. Um, they have so much leverage over the narrative that gets pushed out. We had um, one newspaper call up the, the marketing director um, and basically said, we feel you need to take out a bigger advert for your launch on our front page than what you, you, you plan to have on page six of our newspaper. Otherwise, we're going to run with a negative Bitcoin story. Um, literally, like as clear as day, just... This is how it is. If you don't spend more, we're going to run with negatives. Um, and that's the, the way like the, the world works when it comes to the media and advertising. Um, it's the people that, that keep the lights on, um, that, that have the power and the control. Uh, and fortunately for me, two of the people that ran the biggest marketing agency on the island were making accusations against me and trying to get me to sign over everything. Um, so I stood no chance in the press. Uh, and things like in Cyprus, they'll run it in a local newspaper that gets picked up by Reuters. And because it's Bitcoin and it's this Bitcoin company that gets put out by Reuters and it gets picked up by the, the more larger um, media outlets and it becomes a, a global story. And then when you're next trying to go and open a bank account, you've got adverse media against your name. <laughs> um, uh, things like that. So. Oh, dude, I, I feel for you, man. <laughs> but you know what? But you know what? I, yeah. um, it is what it is. And like, like I say, the book stops here with it all. Um, it was me that kind of got into bed with these people that had them around a business that made the hiring decisions that, that brought the wrong people yeah. around that brought some of these bits and pieces and stuff um, into, into the effect. And I live with the consequences. Um, I'm, it's made me very somewhat stoic. I'm, I'm never really been extroverted or a marketer or, or anything. Um, I have people now that, that try and do that. And I like to be balanced and honest. Um, I, I can't be a, a Bitcoin bull, bull, bull like some people um like fair play to them but i'm absolutely not like that i'd much rather have a, a balanced discussion and explain to somebody the the good parts and there are many uh, of bitcoin and then perhaps also the the balancing effect of um this is what it's not great for uh these are the problems these are how we solve those problems but we need to get to that point of um solving those those problems and um it, it, i i very much don't get a lot of hate now, but like having people tell me to go and hang myself and stuff, um, like became water off a duck's back. So, so I, I, I don't really go out and try and market myself. And um, we've not done any real marketing with fast bitcoins yet. Um, we're we're very much um, it's we we've done localized stuff around branches and everything, but we're about to, to start when we've got some of these new parts uh, launched and some new first that we're doing, um, I'll actually cover one in this call um, a little bit later on, but uh, because it's not been announced yet anywhere. Um, so we are going to start doing more marketing and stuff. And I do expect more hate. Um, one thing that does happen is we get this one person. Um, I know exactly who he is. 
that when Bitcoin pumps in price, he sends uh, a support ticket telling us or telling team members and myself how he's going to come and kill me um, at some point and, and take it out on all of the team members. <clears throat> Our team members are completely distributed around the world. Nobody really knows where they are unless you actually know them. Um, and I sit in this office here in the UK, which is a publicly known address. So the doors always open and you're always welcome. But when Bitcoin goes up in value, he always sends a message, uh, a threatening message, regardless of uh, it being uh, what seven years ago, uh, without fail. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Why? Because he was was he he was one of your like what invested, like he one of the investors that backed the company, and I think when I actually tracked it through the the records and stuff. I think it was like less than two hundred dollars at the time that it backed the company with. Um, and, and, and on that point, Denny, I think you're sorry. Go ahead. You're saying something. Yeah. And what you find is the people with the least at stake, um, they're the ones that are the most vehemently against me. Um, even people that had nothing to do with Neo and B or wasn't even around uh, or wasn't directly um, connected or invested in the company, they're the ones with an issue. Like. <laughs> Um, hey, da 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 Danny, so I mean, like, okay, what you know, I, like I was telling you earlier, um, like I've had a pretty rocky road in this space, you know. Um, uh, but one, one thing that we've done, at least with at least some of the companies I work for, like for the Unicoin specifically, is we raised money from guys like, you know, Barry Silbert and um, Adam Draper, Tim Draper, like people that. Um, they weren't tire kickers and they weren't people that even if they lost, you know, a quarter million dollars or whatever, they're not going to lose sleep. Um, and, uh, and like, you know, so, and, and also, I, I also really kind of cringed at the whole ICO movement, even though, you know, we, Toronto could be argued was ground zero for a lot of it because of uh, certain factors. Right. And so, um, but, 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 but I think you already said that, you know, you kind of regretted, I guess, raising even money in Bitcoin I and mean, ICOs weren't even a thing back then, but you'd raised, raised money in Bitcoin, but, but okay, whatever. So you raised a bit of money and then you said you gave it away and you tried to do some promotion. I mean, like, you know, uh, but I mean, like, so that's the end of that, right? Like, what, 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 the, it, I'm just wondering, like, is, is, is that, is that why you get most of the heat then for I mean, that? hundred percent, right? Because we never actually took customers' funds or started accepting customers and stuff. So 100% of the hate that I get is based upon people that back the company. So these people were backing a Bitcoin startup um, in 2013, 2014. Um, when you actually look at it, it's uh, most startups fail anyway, but this was like ultra risky and we was like, pushing boundaries every like we couldn't get bank accounts to, to liquidate bitcoin i was literally we was having team members fly into like the uk do cash deals uh, and fly around europe doing cash deals to then fly the cash back into cyprus to pay bills in cash because no banks or anything would touch us um and it was absolutely insane and that was costing us um to because we could at the time we was doing like 50k 70k um sterling uh, transactions so about about hundred thousand dollars at a time um, and we'd be flying a hundred thousand dollars in cash or the equivalent of that into cyprus to pay the bills um which was at, like now thinking about it it's something that you can actually make a movie out of like the level of insanity um <laughs> that, that that we was going through but that was coming at like a 10 percent cost um to, to be able to deal with the brokers that had the, enough volume in cash to be able to, to come and buy offers using cash. Um, it was nuts. Um, and, and these are all things that, that people never considered. They literally, the, one of the, the narratives was, was that we did fundraising and like two days later, I disappeared with all of the funds. Um, I really, like now looking back, I wish that was the case. Um, I wouldn't be sat building a company. I'd be sat on a yacht in the middle of somewhere, um, living my best life um, with the the missus and the kids. Uh, and there was just, there was no pictures of you with. What, what, oh, I'm trying, I think I'm getting mixed up. But were there like pictures of or shit of you or something with like fancy things? No, right? Or that picture? Um, 
there was <laughs> right. So sorry, I have. I have. I have <laughs> what am I thinking about? The, there was some memes, uh, but I had a Bentley in Cyprus. I, which I've spoken about this story like since way back when. So, and then when everything was going crazy and I was styling, um, every now and then people would like post links to my social media and stuff like that. So I changed, I don't even really, I don't use Facebook anymore, but I changed my Facebook header to a, a picture of a Ferrari with a bet. Um, it wasn't even my Ferrari. <laughs> it was a random Ferrari that was parked in London that I found on Google. And the bet, we had a, a 10 pound bet. It was a drunken bet. Um, how long would it be before somebody posted that somewhere that I changed my header to, and I'd got a Ferrari um, yeah. and it literally took less than 48 hours. Um, I lost the bet because I said, oh, nobody would probably really give a shit. <laughs> and yeah, like somebody posted that. Um, but I had a Bentley, which really didn't look good um, at the time when everything went crazy. But what that, what actually happened there, I made a profit on that car purely based on the fact that you could import a car from the UK into Cyprus because they're, they're both right-hand drive um, places because it's a former colony. Um, it's formerly run as an overseas territory of the UK for Cyprus. Um, so we had right-hand drive cars and I did a deal between the people behind Havelock. They had 650 Bitcoins to sell and somebody in Cyprus and they agreed a price. And this was probably in, I think it was around October time in 2013. So just before the, the run up in price and the, they agreed the, the deal and the, the deal was to happen with a UK bank transfer from the person in Cyprus who had an account in the UK um, to them, to the UK bank account. And whilst that was all being set up and settled, we agreed on the price and everything. And then the person that was buying the coins went and said, okay, let's make the, the transfer. And they quoted a new price because the price had started to run up. I think it had gone to like 300 and something odd dollars at the time. Um, and he pulled out of the deal. And I really didn't want to let that guy down that was hoping to, to buy them. He was like, no, I'm not doing that deal. So, but he was really disappointed and extremely well connected and a powerful individual within Cyprus. So, I sold him the coins, the equivalent amount of coins of my own coins. So I had uh, the, the funds in a UK bank account sat waiting for me. And it's like, I can't get a bank account in Cyprus because all the banks know me because the newspapers talk about Bitcoin and me and uh, everything. So I couldn't transfer the money to via a bank. So I rang a friend with a car dealership and he was like, let's have a look online we'll see if there's any duties and stuff to, to pay um, and what what cars will sell well so he narrowed it down and he found uh, and sourced a Bentley it cost me like a thousand pound to ship it from uh, from the UK to Cyprus um, and then I bought this Bentley um, for about 60,000 six yeah I think it, all in all, I think it cost me about 63000 to get it to Cyprus. Um, so I get it in Cyprus and I'm like, oh, I've just got this, but I'm going to sell it. And then the, the PR agency goes to me, you do know that you, you can't drive that car if you're going to sell it. Um, because people start talking um, that, oh, he's got to sell his car and, uh, and this, that and the other. So I was like, okay, I'll put it up for sale because it's going to take a couple of months. And it was the summer. Um, it's coming into the to the warmer weather and there's a convertible. Um, so I had a, a Bentley for like two, three months uh, in Cyprus. And with the idea of selling it, ultimately, because there's a, a big premium on luxury cars there. Um, so I sold it for like 120,000 euros uh, in the end after I like, come back to the UK uh, and stuff. So I made a profit on the car um, like I originally planned. But the headline in the newspaper and on the memes was Bentley driving Britain. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it, it looks really bad and I appreciate that. But the story is a lot more boring than, yeah, just spending like 
other people. I love how they they just run with it, eh? They just the uh, hey, it's so it's so interesting. Um, well, I'm sorry. I'm sorry to hear hear that all this it's happened. All uh, it's all you know, I mean, experiences, and it's like one now. I drive a boring car and um, have like nothing. I'm, yeah, it's uh, <laughs> again, it, it, it's a mad story, but I. Uh, it's a Bitcoin story. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Dude, we gotta make um we gotta make a movie we got you gotta you gotta make a movie <laughs> too someday um, but i i would much rather have my legacy on the world be that yeah i built something that either set the foundation for something else um much more impressive or just something that contributed in a positive effect uh, positive fashion mm. um Neo and B could have done, but there were so many like fatal flaws in the business idea, the execution, um, the people, myself, uh, most importantly, that its chance of success was slim to none anyway. Um, as with our most startups, but probably now on reflection even more so, and it did explode. Um, but yeah, like. The, the biggest lesson is, is take, don't take investment from people that don't fully understand, or not that they don't fully understand, but don't, aren't willing to, to take self-responsibility for all of the decisions that they make, um, especially, and the people with the, with the most to lose have the most to lose for a reason, um, because they're probably a little bit smarter and wiser and understand things a lot better. Um, and the people that have the most to lose are the people that are the most cool with me um, to this day. Some of them, like I say, are, are, are involved with fast bitcoins. So, so, yeah. Well, Danny, I'm glad you I'm glad you turned it all around, buddy. And uh, on the way. you know, so, huh? On the way. And I was, I, on the way. On the way. On the way. Yeah, we're never really done, right? I'm actually, forty percent of the way towards repaying everybody that backed Neon B. It probably won't be one to one now with the the current rate that that, that things have gone up and stuff. Um, and I, I created a way for people to register and I had the, um, like the holdings and everything. And still, it's probably going to have to wait now until there's like a, a liquidity event with fast Bitcoins at some point or the, the, the holding companies and the things that we build. Um, but I'm still fully committed to, to doing that um, because these people, the, the decent ones in that group, um, didn't ask for everything that, that came after the fact um so it's it's on me and i've got people that are close to me that were exposed telling me why are you still being so stubborn there's actually no need for you to to be so committed to um to that whole process um but for me it's like the, the decent ones make it worth pursuing uh, to do well, I mean, if you're a scam artist, I, I don't see why you would uh, want to do that. And, you know, I've, I've, I, I, I still haven't shared my story about Gerald. <laughs> One day I will, but I met him and I don't know. I, I think I have a bit of a, um, I think I have a bit of a censor for people who are scammy. And, and I mean, he, 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 he ended up admitting to me in his first meeting with me that he was a scammer <laughs> back in like 2013. Yeah. Can you believe that shit? So um Anyways, listen, man. Okay, let's just switch gears. I can't believe we've already gone like an hour and twenty already. This is crazy. Um, but I think this is—I think this has been instructive as as AF. Um, this has been super. I thought entertaining, educational. Those are my usually my two goals I go for. Um, and and uh, let, okay, so let's before we finish up, I want to ask you a question. So, what is one thing? Oh, and then if you can maybe answer this other thing that you touched on, which was the building on Bitcoin. You said you did some presentation, touch on that. But um, what is one thing that you believe to be true that others in Bitcoin would disagree with you on? Um, yeah. Um, there's a technical group of people that will fully accept it and understand it. Um, and then there's a group of marketers that would say, um, oh no, uh, it's not a thing uh, or claim ignorance. Um, there's actually, well, there's a couple of things. Um, the amount of people I listen to talk about Bitcoin that have said, oh, Bitcoin's unhackable or Bitcoin's never been hacked or broken. Um, sorry to break it to you, but in 2010 it did. Um, there was like billions of Bitcoins created in a single transaction. And, but Bitcoin was really small. And that basically, the, 
it got corrected. Um, but Bitcoin was nothing then as opposed to what it is today. Um, so people that stand on a stage and say Bitcoin's never been hacked or Bitcoin's never been broken are factually incorrect. And I, it's one of my, my bugbears. Um, be honest about it. Um, and then another one is uh, Bitcoin's broken to the fact that it's going to stop working in roughly 90 odd years. Um, we know what the bug is and it can be fixed, but it's a consensus level bug. Um, technical people will say, yep, yeah, that's an issue. Um, we know about it. It can be fixed. It's a really simple fix, but um, it's going to require a hard fork to fix it. And the vast majority of people, especially if you're in the echo chamber that is like Bitcoin Twitter, they would like to gloss over that. And um, it's a real issue. Um, and then also possibly my biggest contrarian point would be we take the, the consensus rules really seriously today. We have lived through fiat currency. We know why there's a, a limit in place, why Bitcoin more resembles gold than it does the dollar um, for its uh, supply, uh, the way that supply enters um, circulation uh, and everything. Uh, and we take that really seriously. But what's to say in four or five generations time that they're going to understand the reasons because um, history rhymes for a reason because people quickly forget lessons um, that they've not directly had to learn. Um, so are those generations in four or five generations time going to appreciate the reasons why we're so um, militant about the rules today, um, like the supply limit, um, the, the, the block reward subsidy that's given to miners? Um, and everything that goes along with that, are they going to appreciate that or are they going to allow it to be coerced and changed um, with social consensus at that point in time down the line when somebody really smart and flashy that's very a very good marketer um, is selling them on the idea that 42 million Bitcoins will be absolutely fine um, because we need to increase like the velocity of money and uh, things like that. Um, are they going to be as militant then as they are, as we are today? Um, because we're like that first generation that have got that understanding of existing in a system. Um, it's obviously, yeah, all open for, for discussion and stuff. But yeah, that's probably my my three contrarian or. And then, and then I think before we started hitting record, you were telling me something about how at an event um, you did a, a presentation on how you know, the number go up is kind of the least exciting thing and building on Bitcoin is kind of important. Do you mind uh, maybe finishing up on that note as well, just because that being kind of the theme and, you know, Daniel is saying is like my goal with this, this thing, whatever the hell I'm doing right now is really to inspire people to, to recognize that you don't have to just buy Bitcoin and, you know, number go up type of deal. You can actually earn Bitcoin. You can build on Bitcoin. You can, you know, and it's hard. It's like the hardest thing that I think I've ever done probably, and maybe you and others, but it's totally worth it. Yeah. Um, the, the entrepreneurial um, path isn't probably isn't for everybody. And for most people just, um, keep your real job in a real world and just dollar cost average and buy Bitcoin over time is probably the best path for most people. Um, but saying that, if you do have ideas um, and you can do it without um, trying to fix Bitcoin um, by creating your own better equivalent that comes with a whole bunch of other trade-offs that you refuse to ignore, and like ICO scams and stuff. Um, if you can build something, we need builders. Um, this technology can change the, the world. Um, we know it can. And there's uh, a lot of the, the people that have been around longer, um, they don't necessarily know more um, than some of the, the people that are coming in even yesterday. Um, 
philosophically altering uh, the, the control of how money is creating uh, and holding a light to, to those that can create money at will um, and everything are noble causes to, to build towards. Um, we can make the world a, a much more transparent and open place and hopefully that can make a difference. It might not stop wars. We had wars when the world was operating on a gold or silver standard, um, uh, things like that. But we, a lot of the, the inequalities, uh, things like that, Bitcoin gives you an opportunity to create a level playing field. And um, I know uh, Bitstein wrote the paper, uh, everybody's a scammer, um, because everybody wants to capture everybody else's Bitcoin. Um, and that's the, the idea um, uh, of economic growth uh, for you as an individual. So why not create something of value or provide a service that other people value that will pay you for? There's no better way to obtain Bitcoin um, than doing that. And for the most part, you, it, people complain about KYC and things, but if you're selling goods and services for Bitcoin and we can create uh, and achieve this circular economy where everybody's living on Bitcoin as an option, um, it kind of, for me, that's a, a real noble goal. And anybody that's willing to, to work towards that has my utmost respect, whether they win or if they fail. Um, for me, it's the one of the most fulfilling and rewarding things that you can do, but it's not easy. Um, as this last hour and a half has shown us, um, that there can be some trials and tribulations along the way, um, but there's plenty of people that you can learn from um, and there's plenty of people that you can speak to. Um, I know that you can just, I can always pick up the phone and speak to you um, and send you a message. And as somebody with experience that has been through the ringer, um, you always get an honest response back. Um, it might not be the news that you want to hear or the opinion that you want to hear. Um, it's... Uh, there's, there's plenty of help out there um, and introductions um, and the, the business sphere um, in the space is pretty well connected. Uh, I mean, even, even people with uh, like the trickier backgrounds like myself, um, I can still speak to absolutely almost anybody uh, to this day and get uh, feedback and help and introductions and stuff like that. So there's no excuse. Um, to, to not give it a shot. Yeah, I know, man. Uh, one of my favorite quotes is, what is it? Forgiveness is the fragrance a violet sheds upon the heel that has crushed it. <laughs> not that you need it, but uh, but you know what, man? Like, I'm really glad we connected today, dude. I'm so happy that I got to hear, you know, the, the story from you because, uh, like I said, I think you really captured a lot of people's imaginations way back in the day. There was a bit of confusion in the midst of all of this. And, and I think it takes a lot of courage. Um, courage, courage. That's another word that I think is, uh, or thing that's in short supply. You know, there's a lot of really smart people out there, but I don't see a lot of courageous people out there. So Danny, uh, in the face of all of it, you continue to build. And that is really kind of the the goal here is just to encourage others to do so. And, and, you know, and like you said, there'll be hard times. I know even myself, uh, my co-founders, we've been buried under a lot of negativity and sometimes you don't even have the financial wherewithal to fight, you know, at the way you want to with a lot of these players, cause they're so powerful, but, um, but we've got YouTube, you know, we've got whatever, whatever means we have. And then those who are, you know, that have the time and the energy they'll, they'll dig in. Um, Danny, do you, I, I was going to go on a few tangents, you know, I, but I do see we're kind of at the end of our hour and a half. So I'd be down to do a part two if you want. We could talk about current events, like more fun shit. This was pretty heavy. <laughs> I can waffle on for far too long. Yeah. Too, too yeah. Yeah, yeah, no, I really enjoyed it, man. And like I said, I'm, I'm doing, I'm, uh, I haven't really shared with anyone, but I'm, I'm about to go berserk with this media shit like I'm, I'm about to like do something that's going to be live stream 24 7 i showed you the at bitcoins twitter handle and then the bitcoins.fm um domain that we've got going on and so so we're going to be kicking things into high gear because as you said media and the control of it is kind of um one of the levers right that 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 they use against us and so 
Um, so no more, no more. Okay, dude, how do you, uh, how do you want to finish this off in terms of how do people plug into your, I don't know, stream of consciousness? It sounds like you're a bit of a introvert. Uh, do you, do you blog? Do you tweet? Do you, uh, where are you? I'm on Twitter at BTC Danny. Um, awesome. Our blog is written by other people in the team. Um, uh, fastbitcoins.com. I tweet at me. I'll hopefully see it. I don't have like masses of followers and stuff like that. I, yeah, I'm open to, to talk to anybody. Um, so, cool, yeah. man. Sounds good. I, yeah, I'd just much rather people know the product and service than know me. Um, so fastbitcoin.com or fastbitcoins? Bitcoins. With an S, nice. Okay, fastbitcoin.com. I'm, I'm in negotiations to get fastbitcoin.com. We've got the trademark, but I don't want to go down the the legal path. I want to come to a. Ah, it's all good, dude. Fast bitcoins. Like, do you want one bitcoin or you want bitcoins? Well, I know it's kind of it goes against the bitcoin ethos. I get it. Um, I've got a legal like basis a to go and be an asshole um, to get that domain. But like I said, I'd much rather do it amicably. Um, but we actually have SATs as a standard uh, on fast bitcoins by default. So we actually provide, we do provide an exchange rate, but we also provide how many SATs you get per dollar or per pound. Um, and you have to toggle that off if you want to see in our like interface um, how many bitcoins you're buying for your hundred dollars instead of SATs. Um, the the cool. tool is on the mainstream, um, but then like. One of the, the features that we've literally just launched is there's some rules around it, but if you withdraw on lightning instead of on chain, we'll give you a bonus. We'll split the difference as to what it's going to cost us in real time in fees to deliver that on chain. We'll, so say if there's, uh, it's going to cost us the equivalent of like 50,000 sats to deliver an on chain payment to you. Um, we'll give you 25,000 sats as the bonus. So, cause we're saving the 50,000. So we'll split that with you if you take it on lightning. Um, so if you receive it on the lightning network, as opposed to on chain, we're creating less traffic on the, the blockchain and we're giving people the use of real Bitcoin on lightning. Um, they can go and spend that in so many places or they can do a swap and uh, get it out and stuff. So, that's something I think we'll be the first that does that. Uh, and we've just launched that. Um, that's so that's sick, dude. I, I mean, that's awesome. That's, I love it. Uh, it seems like you guys are really, you guys are thinking about these, these important things, right? Lightning. It seems like you're, you're focused on, um, you know, expanding kind of making sure that lots of people have access. You've got all these kiosks, not kiosks, but like the stores and places, it's different like, touch for me, points. For in people... India, like, hmm. I, Amazon just looked like launched recently, didn't they? Where you can go and collect the parcels from these like street vendors. Um, if mm -hmm. I understand how it's established there. One of my, I've had conversations about it was like, if we could put or turn these street vendors into fast Bitcoins locations. Um, because the, one of the problems and the original idea was to go after the Bitcoin ATM space because people shouldn't be paying like 20% or 25% to use a Bitcoin ATM. Um, and we can do it with a, a much lower cost. I understand why ATMs charge that much because handling cash is expensive. Um, and also the hardware is expensive and it comes with a risk um, of, of being stolen. So, so for me, like the whole ATM um, market is ripe for disruption and that's what we 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 tried to do and we have a lot of our customers were originally um, atm users but they come over to using us um to to get the bitcoin because it's like four percent using cash instead of 20 odd percent cool well i like it man dude this is awesome uh Daniel. like i said dude, if you want to come back on uh next week next month next whenever you're free just ping me and uh we should do this again and you know and just kind of catch up but uh thanks thanks dude any any anything else or should i uh should we kill this one then all right we'll good? do part two um all right sounds good